Cade Mila Falcha. Welcome to the third episode in a series on the ancient tales of Ireland presented by the Dunmore Druid Order. Each month, we tell a story from Old Ireland. This series is sponsored by the Dunmore Druid Order, and if you wish to learn more about Dunmore, you can find us on Facebook and at www.dunmoredruidry.com. That's D-U-N-M-O-R-D-R-U-I-D-R-Y dot com. If you enjoy these stories, take a few brief moments to comment on the YouTube video or on the Dunmore blog that links to the podcast. For our third tale, we will tell of the birth of one of the greatest of the Tuatadanan, the many-skilled lord of the Shi, Lu. Welcome to our fireside. Let's begin. Long ago, in a time that still sings in our blood, when rivers were clear and so full of fish that you could walk from one bank to the other without getting wet, when the skies at night were so full of stars that you could swear you could reach out and pluck them down like ripe diamonds. There lived a beautiful white cow with red-tipped ears and jet-black hooves. She was glass goblin. Her udders gave the sweetest, purest milk than any other cow in the wide world. She was the greatest nourishment to the mighty Tuatadanan, and her milk never ran dry. But, like all sources of wealth, she came with a great price. The cow glass goblin had been obtained in return for building a tower of seamless glass. But this glass was special glass. Glass that had the strength of steel and gleamed like polished silver in the sun. The tower was the stronghold of the Favoira, the great ones who lived under the sea. A tower built for the most fearsome among them, the brutish and terrible Balor of the Evil Eye. Balor's power was so terrible that even the mighty Tuatadanan feared him. For all the strength in his arms, his greatest weapon was his eye, and he had only one. One great eye in the center of his forehead, an eye he had to keep covered. When he was a boy, he had peeked in through a window to see a potion of venom bubbling away in a great cauldron. As he spied it, a great boil burst on its surface and it splashed into his eye. So terrible, this poison, that the boy soon realized that anything he looked upon would burst into flame. So the Favoira, fearing this power, made a heavy eye patch of lead with a handle that Balor could not lift. The eye patch could only be lifted by another. Imagine the shock and sadness of a boy, knowing he would never again look on the faces of his father, mother, friends, or favorite places without seeing them burn. Imagine being shunned by your own people because they feared you. Balor did not grow up in the company of kindness. He grew up in the company of rage. As terrible as he was, Balor had one place in his heart where he knew love. That place was for his daughter, Ellen. Ellen was a beauty that rarely comes into this world. She was as fair and as rare as a rose blooming in winter. She was as kind as her father was cruel. When she was born, the druids made a prophecy that Balor would one day be killed by Ellen's son. To prevent this from ever happening, Balor decided to build the great tower of shining glass and put Ellen inside. It is a sad truth that sometimes when the light of a daughter shines that bright, fathers have a hard time letting that light go. Balor, however, had a problem. There were no craftsmen among the Favoira who had the skill to build him such a tower. 
there was only one craftsman with that skill, the great smith Govanin Gao, and he was of the Tua de Donan. During these dark days, because Balor's eye was so feared, the Favoira ruled the Tua de Donan as subjects. So when Balor came to Govanin Gao to order the work done, Govanin Gao saw that Balor's need made him vulnerable. He would build the tower, but only, he said, if his wages were the glass goblin, who was Balor's prized possession. Balor agreed, with duplicity in his mind, and the tower was built. When the time came for Balor to pay his wages, he gave Govanin Gao glass goblin, but withheld the buyer rope that kept her from wandering astray. Balor knew that without the rope, Glass Goblin would always stray sixty miles each day, thirty miles out and thirty miles back. Like all sources of great wealth, its maintenance can rule all your days and steal your sleep at night. But Govanin had wisdom. He knew that only when wealth is hoarded does it rule you, so he spread the wealth that Glass Goblin helped create. In return for watching her for a single day, he would give the warrior who watched her a sword of his finest make. Since his swords were legendary, he was never without a volunteer. A person with true wisdom knows that wealth is not maintained alone. It cannot be the sole focus of your life, and in spreading its gifts to others, it is only increased. When Balor of the evil eye heard of Govanin's generosity, however, he grew angry, as he had always intended to steal her back. So he waited and watched. He hassled and attacked the Tuatadanan and levied harsh taxes on them from his impregnable tower of glass. Over the years that followed, Ellen grew up in the tower. She grew into a very, very beautiful woman. Without belaboring the point, her skin was as satin, and her eyes were deep and curious, and her voice was the river in spring. For his own peace of mind, Balor had set, as guardians and companions to Elin, three hundred fair-haired women, three hundred dark-haired women, and three hundred red-haired women. These women watched her day and night, and were tasked with meeting her every need feeding her, clothing her, washing her, and entertaining her. But their real purpose was, in fact, to keep all men and all knowledge of men far away. But the world is a grand and powerful place, and no matter how hard we may try to shelter the young and keep them as our own personal treasures, the young will, in the end, always refuse to be sheltered. Helen's favorite moments was when she was finally able to be alone, standing atop her tower and just looking out over the overwhelming beauty of Donegal. It was on one of these days that Ellen saw something she had never seen before. A man. Near the cliffs below her tower one day, she saw a small boat. And on that boat, there he stood, Kian of the Tua de Danan. Bare-chested, glistening with sea spray, his black hair soaked and covering just a part of his face, straining every muscle in his body, hauling a large net of fish over the side of his coracle. Well, needless to say, that sight took her breath away. Her knees were weak and her eyes were soft. Then, Kian looked up at her. He could see her standing like a distant prize on the top of the mysterious tower that his people had always told him to avoid. He could see her hair shining in the sun, the curves of her form, and the wild, caged look in her eyes. From that moment forward, all Kian wanted was to set her free. May we all be as blessed in our lives to have at least one moment like the one Ellen and Kian shared that day. Ellen could think of nothing else after that day, and like all women of magical birth, Ellen could dream, 
really dream. And in those dreams she saw the face of the man that made her heart leap and her knees weak. But when Ellen asked the women who watched over her about the mysterious fisherman and her dreams of him, they refused to answer, and a shadow of fear covered them. The handsome Kian was, in fact, along with Samthan, the brothers of Govanin Gao. Both were great warriors among the Tuatadanan, and each volunteered to watch Glasgavlan in return for one of his legendary swords. Kian was first, and watched Glasgavlan over sixty grueling miles, coming back at sunset exhausted from her wanderings. Gian had used the perfect blend of coercion and freedom to bring the beast home. His brother, Samthan, wasn't so skillful. Samthan spent the day yelling and throwing things at Glass Goblin, vainly trying to force her to take the paths he preferred. Well, during all this fuss, Samthan slipped, broke his foot, and the Glass Goblin wandered away. And no sooner had she wandered away when the Favoira seized her, tied her with the Baya rope, and dragged her away across the sea to Balor's island. Hearing Glass Goblin was lost, Govanin Gao gave Samthan one year to find her and bring her home. Samthan could not go after the cow himself because of the sorry state of his foot, so Kian, remembering the girl who lived on the island, selflessly volunteered to find Glass Goblin and bring her back. To accomplish this, Kian sought the advice of a druid. But the druid told Kian that so long as Balor lived, Glass Goblin would never be safe in Ireland. Leaving the druid, Kian decided he had only one more option. Go to Birog of the mountain. Birog lived in the great mansions beneath Mount Aragal. Birog of the mountain was not only a druidess, but she was a Lananchi, a fairy lover, a lady of rare beauty, artistic inspiration, and terrible power. Birog told Kian that if he wanted to recover the cow, he must eat seven years of her butter, three freshly cut sorrel leaves, and seven years meat. Once this was done, said the Lananchi, you must lie with three hundred dark-haired women, three hundred red-haired women, and three hundred fair-haired women, and each of them will bear children in nine months' time. Uh, that's a terrible number of children, said Kian. Well, said Birog, all of those women watch over Ellen, Balor's only daughter, and they let no man visit her. But you must find a way to be with her, Kian, for only Ellen's son will be able to kill the evil eye. Very well, said Kian, but never mind these other women. That is not possible, said Birog. You will go first to Balor's daughter, but you must treat the other women with her the same, or in their jealousy they will betray you to Balor of the evil eye. Still, that is a terrible number of women. True to the Lananshi's nature of draining the essence from a man, Birog of the mountain brought forth a belt. Don't worry, I will give you this belt, which will make you as fresh and bright-eyed with the last woman as you are with the first. But you must bring all these children to me. So, Kian, his manly confidence bolstered by the gift of the magical belt, decided he would make the sacrifice. It was to retrieve his brother's property, after all, and reluctantly agreed to give his attentions to all 900 women. A sacrifice any true Irishman would be willing to make for kin and country. Many Irishmen consider one of the greatest tragedies to befall Ireland the loss of that magical belt. Birog waited for nightfall and summoned a great mist that carried herself and Kian from the slopes of Aragal across the waters to Tor Mor, where the glass tower stood and Ellen waited. 
Kian made his way to Ellen's room and beheld her for the first time, and she him. They were utterly helpless to one another. But Kian's task was not yet finished. He stayed on the island nine months, hidden by all 900 women, and soon <laughs> found himself the father of 900 children. True to his word, Kian wrapped the children in a cloak when they were born, walked to a cliff overlooking the sea where Birog waited for him and handed the cloak to her. Without a word, Birog poured the lot of them off the cliff and into the sea. But these children did not drown. With her magic, they were transformed, and they became the first Selkies, the fairies who can change from seals to people and back again. Their children's children still swim the waters of Ireland and Scotland to this very day. Ellen herself, however, gave birth to triplets, boys. But when Balor found out about her children, he grew afraid. So he ordered the three children thrown into the sea. Two of the triplets were drowned, but the third was not. The third child was rescued by Birog and brought back in secret to Ellen. But something was wrong with the boy. He was small, very small. He had little color in his cheeks and even less strength than his hands. And perhaps most troubling, he was almost never hungry. The child's heart was heavy with the memory of his drowned brothers. And as many of us know, when the heart is heavy, the body cannot thrive. In desperation, Ellen sent for Birog and pleaded with her to heal her son. Birog moved her hands over the child, singing. After some time of this, Birog stopped and shook her head. The child will not thrive unless his grandfather calls him by name. But how were they to get Balor, who never went near children, to name the lad before death eventually overcame him? For although the boy continued to grow, he grew slowly. He was always sick, and they all knew that death would eventually win. So a deception was planned. A deception, they hoped, would win them both prizes, the return of Glasgowlin, and a name to heal the boy. After the boy had grown a few years, his father, Kian, dressed himself and the boy in the clothes of common gardeners, and he walked to Balor's fortress, carrying the boy on his back. Kian knew that with one look, Balor could burn him and the boy to ashes, but still he went. Kian knew the important truth, that to conquer our fears we must face them until they no longer have power over us or those we love. When he reached the gate, Balor stood towering over the walls of his fortress and asked why he had come. Kian asked him for work so he could feed himself and his ailing son. What can you do? asked Balor. I am the best gardener in the world, says Kian. I have a better gardener than you, says Balor. You have not, says Kian. What can your gardener do? The tree that he plants on Monday morning has the finest ripe apples by Saturday night. That's nothing, says Kian. The tree that I plant in the morning, I'll pick apples from it in the evening. Every one, the finest and ripest that ever you saw. Balor could smell this child on his back and asked, What child is that with you? My own child, his mother is dead. I do not like children near my castle, says Balor. But if you are such a gardener as you say, then I will keep you for a time. But what wages would you be looking for? I want no wages, says Kian. Only the cow, Glass Gavlin, to be given to me when my time is up. And with deception in his heart, Balor replied, In a year and a day, you'll get her. Kian planted his trees in the mornings and harvested them in the evenings. 
Balor was pleased with his service, and the year went by slowly. One day, Balor emerged from the fortress and walked to the apple groves, led by some of his servants. When they arrived, Balor asked his servants what they saw. Kian, climbing the trees and gathering the apples that ripened in the last rays of the setting sun, they said. And on the ground, lying against a tree, was the gardener's son. And although too weak to stand, still helped his father by throwing fallen apples with such accuracy that he knocked apples from the highest of limbs. With that image in his mind, fear began to boil up from the depths of Balor's stomach, and although he did not understand why, he wanted nothing more than that boy sent far away, saying, Take away with you that little long arm. Then, in the last glow of twilight, Kian could see color coming into the boy's face for the very first time. The boy stood up, as if he had always known how, and ran off, singing. Oh, says Kian under his breath, he has his name now. And to this day, he is called Lu Lauda, meaning Little Long Arm. After a year and a day was done, Kian went to Balor, thanked him for his employment, and asked for the cow. Certainly, says Balor, but the only one who can give you glass goblin is my daughter, Ellen, who carries his buyer rope, and whosoever she chooses to throw the rope to is the only one who can really lead her. So, Balor and Kian walked together towards the great gleaming tower where Ellen was kept. As they walked, Balor smiled, for he was sure that Ellen would never throw the rope to Kian, for he knew she loved him above all. When they arrived at the tower, they stood below her. Ellen knew it was Kian, and her heart leapt. She had not seen him since he had left. Ellen took up the buyer rope and threw it straight away to Kian. How could you do that, my daughter? Balor roared. Oh, father, there is a crooked cast in my arm. I meant to throw it to you, but it was to Kian that it went. Many a father knows this moment well, that inevitable day when your daughter falls in love and her attention and devotion suddenly shifts to another. It's a shock for any father, and it was a shock for Balor too. So Kian led Glass Goblin back to Ireland, and a few days later, Ellen escaped from her confinement and joined him. The only person who ever loved him was gone, and Balor's heart turned black. Little Lou also disappeared. He would end up in Awanavlach, the land of apples, and mentored by the wisest of all the Tuatadanan, the great lord of the sea, Mananan Maklir. And there, Lu would stay until the day Balor returned to take back Glass Goblin and burn all of Ireland in his rage. But first, he was given to his foster mother, the great goddess of the Firvalik, Telchu. With her, Lu would experience his deepest love and his greatest sadness. Thank you for joining us. Next moon, we will continue this story about Lu Lawada and tell the story surrounding his foster mother, Telchu, and how the first Lunasa came to be. Until then, may the Tua Dedanen watch over you, and may Lu himself place your heart in your hands.